we will start by calling Keir Starmer to move the motion. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I beg to move the motion in my name and the other names um, on the order sheet for today. Mr Speaker, the motion I've tabled seeks to defend the simple principle that honesty, integrity and telling the truth matter in our politics. That is not a principle that I or the Labour Party have a special claim to. It's a British principle. It's a principle that's been cherished by Conservatives for as long as their party has existed, embraced by Unionist and Nationalist parties alike, and one that still guides members from every political party in this House. But, I will. It, um, um, the member of the leader, opposition leader giving way. I lost my mother to COVID in the first lockdown. It was a very painful experience because she was in a hospital bed. We obeyed the rules. We could not be by her side when she passed. I have made my disquiet known to the Prime Minister a couple of times now, and he has taken that on board. I am deeply unhappy at the way number 10 has uh, performed over this pe period in question. But what I would suggest to uh, the right honourable member is that it, it's perfectly natural in this country that you weigh all the evidence before deciding on intent, because the central issue here is whether the Prime Minister misled Parliament. Would you agree that, in this all accepting, that it should be referred to the Privileges Committee that committee needs to weigh all evidence before coming to a decision, and that includes the Sue Gray report. Yeah, yeah. Can, can I just say to others, interventions are meant to be short. What I would say, and I do say to us, if you're intervening and you are on the list, you will go alone. I know the Honourable Member is not, and obviously wouldn't want to now he's made his speech. Yes, no. <laughs> uh, can I just first say I'm sorry, I'm sorry for the loss within your family and we all send our condolences i know how difficult it has been for so many during this difficult period um, in relation to the substantive intervention just two points and i'll develop them later the first is there is already a case before the house that's um, very clear the prime minister said no rules were broken 50 fines for breaking the rules and the law have already been issued so there's already um, a reasonable case but under the motion, because I do understand the sentiment behind the intervention, um, if the motion is passed, the committee will not begin their substantive work until the police investigations are complete, so that they will have all of that evidence before them, one way or the other, uh, in order to come to a view. And I think that's within the body of the motion, and that's the right way and the way it should um, work. And I hope that does um, address the concerns that have been raised. But, but uh, I will. I think if I give away. And further to that point, if the Honourable Gentleman across the way, many of us in the Chamber have uh, lost loved ones over the last period of time, and we feel greatly aggrieved that we haven't had the opportunity to uh, uh, have our, our day in court, if that's the way to put it, perhaps. We, we do feel the need to have uh, justice seen for all those who have lost loved ones, those who, who passed away and who we miss greatly. Uh, does the right Honourable Gentleman feel, when it comes to justice, while we do need to see all of the evidence, there also, at the end of that day, has to be accountability in this process. And accountability means people have to answer for what their actions have been. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, can I express my sadness at the loss that he and his family have endured? And I, I was struck particularly just a few months ago in the way that um, he spoke about that um, in this House. I think we all were. But on the substantive point, uh, this is really the point of the motion. This is about honesty, integrity, and telling the truth in this place. Um, and it's an important principle, and it's one we all share. I'm, as I say, I'm not claiming this as a Labour Party principle. It is a principle that we all share because we know the importance of it. That's why it's a matter um, for the House to consider. But it is a principle under attack um, because the Prime Minister has been accused of repeatedly, deliberately, and routinely misleading this House over parties held in Downing Street during lockdown. Now that's a serious allegation, because if it's true, it amounts to contempt of Parliament. Um, and it's not, and it should never be, an accusation that is made lightly. 
and nor should we diminish the rights of members to defend each other from that accusation. But the Prime Minister's supporters don't seek to do that. Instead, many of them seek to simply dismiss its importance. They say there are worse crimes. He didn't rob a bank. He only broke the rules for 10 minutes. It was all a long time ago. Every time one of, I will in just a moment. Every time one of these arguments is trotted out, the status of this house is gradually eroded and our democracy becomes a little weaker because the convention that Parliament must not be misled and that in return we don't accuse each other of lying are not curious quirks of this strange place. They're fundamental pillars on which our constitution is built and they're observed wherever parliamentary democracy thrives. With them, our public debate is elevated. When members assume good faith on behalf of our opponents, we can explore, test, interrogate our reasonable disagreements about how we achieve our common goals. Because ultimately, no matter which benches we sit on, no matter which whip we follow, fundamentally, we are all here for one reason, to advance those common goals of the nations, of the peoples that make up our United Kingdom. And I give way. Great to the uh, Leader of the Opposition for giving way. He mentioned some of the arguments around, well, it was just nine minutes. Well, I met a woman who was a daughter of a serviceman. He lost his life the week before that birthday party. And she said to me, what I wouldn't give for just nine more minutes with him. I congratulate him on the way he's rising above party politics here, but to yeah, just yeah. diminish yeah. nine minutes as just anything, it diminishes us all across both sides of this house. Would you not agree? Yeah. 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 Well, I'm grateful for that intervention because it goes to the heart of the matter because some have tried to suggest that a short period um, or there's some equivalence between these penalty notices and speeding. And that just doesn't understand the enormity of the difference. It's very rare that the whole of the nation goes through something together, a trauma together that was COVID. Um, and there were the, the awful cases of funerals, of weddings that were missed, of parents who didn't see the birth of their children. And they're awful cases. But I think almost every family was marked during this period including my own, by things that we didn't do that we would have liked to have done, usually visiting elderly parents, seeing children. And there was a huge sense of guilt that we didn't do it, including in my own family. Guilt that because we followed the rules, we didn't do what we thought was actually right by our elderly relatives. And that's why it hurt so much. And that's why anybody trying to say this is just like a speeding ticket doesn't understand what this goes to politically and emotionally. And the, I, I will in just one moment, but just going back to the principles, because I want this debate to be about the principles, because I think this is where the debate should be. The committee will, have, will be charged if this motion goes through in determining actually whether there was any misleading. But this is about the principles that we all care about. And that's why I actually think that everybody should simply vote for this motion this evening to uphold those principles. Because those principles that we don't mislead the House, and in return we don't call each other liars in this House, they ensure, they ensure, I will in just a minute, they ensure that we make good decisions and avoid bad ones. It's what our, makes our democracy grow in ways that reflect the hopes and tackle the fears of those that we represent. It's what makes our democracy thrive. It's what makes this house thrive. It's what makes Britain thrive. Yeah. And Mr. Speaker, we don't have to look far to see what happens when that faith is lost. And there is no hope of reason resolving disagreements. When nations are divided, when they live in different worlds where their own truths and their own alternative facts Democracy is then replaced by an obsession with defeating the other side. Yeah. 
those we disagree with become enemies, the hope of learning and adapting is lost. Politics becomes a blood sport rather than a quest to improve lives. A winner takes all politics where inevitably everyone loses out. I will give way, and then I'll give way to the The Leader of the Opposition was big-hearted enough to say earlier that he unwittingly messed, misled the House. I'm sure you'd agree with me that it's very important that we stick with the convention that we don't cause, call each other liars. There's a good reason for that. Two of our colleagues have been killed. There's been a lot of attacks on colleagues. So in this debate, can we just accept that everybody here is an honourable member? And when, they, and when they speak here, they may unwittingly mislead the House, but they think that they were, for instance, abiding with the rules. So can we tone down the whole nature of this debate? Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you for that intervention. And I, I will try to keep within those parameters and elevate this to the principle that we're actually discussing today, which is the principles that uh, we apply when we're debating this chamber. I will keep playing behind. I'm very grateful to uh, my friend for giving way, uh, and also for what he's said about the fact that we don't on this side have a monopoly on truth. I think yeah. it's a very important point that he's made there. But does he agree with me that there's something really fundamental about this, and that is whether we, as members of Parliament, are fit to uh, hold these powers that we have in terms of holding people to account, or whether politics will always get in the way. And it was very disturbing to hear that um, because there was a Labour chair, uh, Conservative members might vote against it. And that's very disappointing. The Honourable Member for Ronda felt he had to step down. But that principle that either we have an independent or we do it ourselves is, is very important here. Well, I'm grateful for that intervention. And, and, and it is very important. We do have these uh, procedures to um, hold us all to the rules of this House. And it's very important that they are uh, applied in the right way, um, with the right principles. I will give way um, because I said I would once more never get here. I'm grateful to him for giving way. He's making a, a very powerful speech. On the point of procedures, I wonder if you would agree with me that there is a bigger point here about Parliament's governance structures, that our whole system of checks and balances is completely out of date. It is beyond ludicrous that the arbiter of whether or not the ministerial code has been broken is the person who's accused of breaking it, in this instance, the Prime Minister. Yeah. Does he agree with me that we also need a wider look at those governance structures, which at the moment are simply not fit for purpose? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Talk for that intervention, because I do think it's a very serious point, because a lot of our conventions and rules and traditions are based on the principle of honour, and that people, uh, members of this House, wouldn't, other than inadvertently, mislead the House. Um, and that's why... Um, the rules are set, but they're set on that proposition. And if, if there is a member of this House, whoever that is, that doesn't abide by those principles, uh, those honourable principles, then that tests or stress tests the rules that we have. I'll take one more intervention and then I will give way. I, I understand completely the position the honourable gentleman opposite said about toning down the rhetoric. I completely understand that. But let, let, me, let me just... Let me just... I understand that position, but let me make this point, because I am, know the Honourable Gentleman over the years. We can't tone down the seriousness of this matter. Yes. Yeah. I was in the, part the Prime Minister's constituency earlier this week. It's the neighbouring constituency to mine, the London Borough of Hillingdon. We're campaigning in the election. So, yeah, there is some shift in vote from Tory to, to Labour because of the decision, but that isn't a significant issue. The significant was the number that we were finding totally disillusioned now, yeah. who'd had enough of this system, were blaming the system itself. That's what we're fighting for here. This is what we're campaigning for here. We're campaigning to restore the credibility in the democratic processes of our country. Yeah. And I'm grateful for that intervention. I think it's a really important and powerful point because if we don't pass this motion, if we don't take this opportunity to restate the principles, then we are all complicit in allowing these standards to slip. We're all complicit in allowing the public to think we're all the same, nobody tells the truth, uh, there are alternative sets of facts. I, I, I will in one minute, I've given away a lot and I do want to uh, make some progress, but I'll try and come back to the Honourable Member. But because the conventions... I'll, I'll make some progress and I'll try to come um, back to people where I can. Um, 
the conventions and the traditions that we are debating this morning are not an accident. They've been handed down to us as the tools that protect Britain from malaise, from extremism, and from decline. And this is important because the case against the Prime Minister is that he has abused those tools. That's the case against him, that he's used them to protect himself rather than our democracy, that he's turned them against all that they are supposed, supposed to support. Um, and members opposite know that the Prime Minister has stood before this House and said things that are not true, safe in the knowledge that he will not be accused of lying, because he can't be. He stood at the dispatch box and point blank denied rule breaking took place when it did. And he did so, as he did so, he was hoping to gain extra protection from our good faith that no Prime Minister would ever deliberately mislead this House. He's used our faith, our conventions, to cover up his misdeeds. Because, I'll just finish this point, because after months of denials, of absurd claims that all the rules were followed, of feigned outrage at his staff discussing rule breaking, we now know the law was broken. We know the Prime Minister himself broke the law. Yep. And we know that he faces the possibility of being found to have broken it again and again and again. Because the police investigation is ongoing, we don't need to make final judgment on the Prime Minister's contempt of Parliament today. When the time comes, the Prime Minister will be able to make his case. He can put his defence, of course he can. He can make his case that his repeated misleading of Parliament was inadvertent as his defence, that he didn't understand the rules that he himself wrote. He can make that defence. <laughs> that his advisers at the heart of Downing Street either didn't understand the rules either or misled him when they assured him that they were followed at all times or that he thought he was at a work event even while the empty bottles piled up. He can make those defences. He can make those defences when the time comes. But, Mr Speaker, I, I will interest a minute. We already know he has a case to answer. The Prime Minister said no rules were broken. But over 50 fines for breaching the rules and the law have now been issued, including to the Prime Minister. And anybody who denies that simple fact has their head in the sand or given up any interest in the truth, given up interest in the traditions of our nation, in order to prop up a law-breaking Prime Minister. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the motion today would refer the matter to the Committee for Privileges, a committee that has a government majority. So no one can say the Prime Minister is not being judged by his peers. The committee would only investigate the Prime Minister for contempt once the police have concluded their investigation. So no one can say there is prejudice to the rest of the inquiry. And of course, any findings the committee comes to, any sanctions they might propose, would then come back before this House as a whole. So no one can say it's too soon for the House to decide. It is a system of self-governance, and it should be, because with the great privilege that comes with sitting in this place, comes the great responsibility to protect the conventions that underpin our democracy. Yeah. I will give way. Thank you. I'm grateful to the Honourable Member for giving way. On conventions, does he also agree that language is equally important? And therefore, would he take this opportunity to distance himself from the Honourable Member who spoke earlier on, who said that he wanted to lynch another Honourable Member, or the Honourable Member who sat right next to him? He should distance himself from them. Yeah. That's a shame. I actually thought we were having a reasonably serious debate. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. I'll just say to the Honourable Lady, she needs to sit down. In fairness to the member in charge he's given a lot of interventions but that certainly don't need to stand up and waiting to catch somebody's eye here's that one yeah. Yeah. mr speaker
Mr. Speaker, that if this just descends into a shouting match, we, we lose the principle which is there to defend all of us, all of us, including all the members opposite. We're not claiming a principle to support these benches and not those benches. It's a principle that supports all of us. Uh, and, and if we fail, if we fail in our... I, I will take that intervention, yes, of course. Most shameful. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition has quite rightly just said that it affects everybody in this House. Uh, would he accept that at this very moment in time there is a complication, which is that the Committee on Standards Report, which is currently being conducted under the aegis of the Sir Ernest Ryder uh, recommendations, does raise questions about whether or not it is possible at this juncture to have a fair trial in natural justice. That is currently under discussion. That is currently under discussion within the House. And the same will apply in regard to the question of the Committee on Privileges, which has itself already been criticised. I was on the Joint Committee myself, and I can assure the Leader of the Opposition there are serious problems which arise in relation to the need to rectify those omissions in the procedural fairness. I'm grateful for that intervention, and I've heard the case he puts on natural justice now a number of times, and of course he has every right to make that case. I disagree. But that's the point of the debates we have. Um, but that debate about natural justice or due process doesn't need to hold up this process. Yeah. This motion could pass today, yeah. should pass today, and frankly everybody should support it passing today to uphold the principles. And I don't think that this, there is a discussion about natural justice, an interesting debate. We will uh, take different views on this. Um, but that doesn't need to hold up this process. I will give way and then I'll make some more progress. The right Honourable Gent for giving way, and he's quite correct to prosecute the case on the basis of principle. But there is still in the order paper, even if the government is not going to move it now, an amendment which would indicate that not everybody in this House shares his view about the importance of these principles. So does he share my view that at the conclusion of this debate, there should be a division so that we know where every single member of this House stands in relation to this principle. Because at a time like this, on an issue like this, there should be no hiding place for anyone. Yeah. Yeah. I'm grateful for that intervention and I agree because um, we have a duty here today in relation to this motion and relation to these principles. And if we fail in our duty, the public will not forgive and forget that we have done so, because this will be the parliament that failed. Failed to stand up for honesty, integrity and telling the truth in politics. Failed to stand up to a prime minister who seeks to turn our good faith against us. And failed to stand up for our great democracy. And it's not just the eyes of our country that are upon us. It will also be the judgment of future generations who will look back at what members of this great house did when our customs were tested, when its traditions were pushed to breaking point, when we were called up to stand up for honesty, integrity and for truth. I move the motion, Mr Speaker. I now come to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I think on a day like this, we think of all of those that made so many sacrifices over the COVID pandemic, those that lost so many loved ones, and our thoughts and our prayers today are with each and every one of them. Mr Speaker, there is one reason why it is so important that this motion is debated and passed today. Because at the very heart of the scandal, there is one thing that needs to be said. One thing that needs to be heard, and it's the very reason that we all need to act. And the reason is this, that the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom is a liar. I genuinely don't say that lightly, and I don't say it loosely. I honestly believe that it's right that we are slow to use that word. But I equally believe and that it is right that we should never be slow to say it and to call it out when it is so obviously true. Because members across this House know it to be true, and the public have long known that to be true. And that is why it needs to be said today, and why we all need to act. Because, Mr Speaker, every single day in this chamber, 
there are motions that come before this House which are complex and nuanced. And there are usually two sides to an argument and valid reasons from whichever position is proposed. But I think we can safely say that this definitively isn't one of these debates. The evidence of the motion speaks for itself. It's as clear as day. If there ever was an open and shut case, <coughs> this is it. Mr Speaker, last December, the Prime Minister came to this House and denied that there were any parties in 10 Downing Street during the long COVID lockdowns. Typically and tellingly, he hid behind his staff in saying it. He told us that he was given firm reassurance that no parties had happened, that no rules had been broken. Every member of this parliament witnessed it. The public saw it with their own eyes. And shamefully, to this very day, it is still on the record of this House that we know the truth. And the truth contains no ifs, no buts, and no maybes. Mr Speaker, the House was misled. Yeah, yeah. And so were the public. And we were all misled deliberately because the Prime Minister knew the truth. Yeah. Not only were parties happening, not only was the law broken, the Prime Minister was at the very parties he denied had even happened. Yeah. Yeah. The truth is simple and it's this. He lied to avoid getting caught. And once he got caught, he lied again. Mm -hmm. There is no other way to describe it. There is no other word for it. Now, Mr Speaker, I can understand that this may be a terrible truth for the government benches to hear. But it's a truth that they need to hear. And it's a truth they need to live with. And I say to the Father of the House, who I've got the utmost respect for, this has got nothing to do with any elections. This is about the behaviour of a Prime Minister in office. And much more importantly, the uncomfortable truth that the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom is a liar is exactly why they finally need to act and remove him from office. Yeah, yeah. And other Prime Ministers, including all the predecessors as Conservative Prime Ministers, would have been long gone by now. Mr Speaker, the benches opposite put the Prime Minister in power. They have the power to remove them, and the public expect them to act. Mr Speaker, we have reached this point, a motion of contempt for a sitting Prime Minister is shocking, but unfortunately, it is no surprise. Will my right honourable friend give way? I will happily give way. I'm grateful to my right honourable friend uh, for giving way. He's made an important point about the members on the benches opposite being here to uh, listen and to see this. And regardless of the number of flushed or drained faces opposite, what does he say to those who have previously called for the Prime Minister uh, to resign, but now, as things have got worse, have changed their position and are not here? Today. <laughs> well, I, I'm grateful for that intervention, and I will come on to that in a little bit more detail. But I say to everybody, the Tory MPs that are here and those that are not here for whatever reason, is to show some moral fibre, to show a backbone, to recognise what this Prime Minister is doing to the very fabric of our democracy. And today, today of all days, to do the right thing and support this motion that is in the name of the Leader of the Opposition, but so many other parties in this House as well. Mr Speaker, we shouldn't forget that when the Tories put this Prime Minister into Downing Street nearly three years ago, the Tories knew... No, actually, it was the Conservatives that elected Boris Johnson as their leader. And the important fact, Mr Speaker, is that the Tories knew exactly the kind of person that they were putting into the highest office in the land. They knew his track record. They knew his character. 
They knew who he was. They knew what he was. And they still chose him as their leader. Of everyone in this house, the members opposite know better than anyone else that a trail of scandal and law-breaking was always going to define his time in office. And in these three short years, unfortunately those who made those predictions haven't been disappointed. The sleaze and the scandal have been ten a penny. From lying to the Queen, to illegally prorogate Parliament, to shut this Parliament... Oh, 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 oh. I, we've got to be careful. I've asked for moderate language, more temperate language, and lying to the Queen and bringing the Queen to I'm not having it. Ian Blackford, I want you to withdraw. Withdraw. I want you to just withdraw that one. Since, in deference to yourself, Mr Speaker, I will do so, but let's not forget the fact that the Prime Minister was found in the highest court in the land of illegally proroguing this Parliament. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuffing the House of Lords. <laughs> As I said at the beginning, I, I know the Honourable Member we want to stick to what I said. It is about the terms of what we are debating. We can't go beyond that. So I know he's very good he, and he can sti stick to the script that I've explained that we do so. Ian Blackford. I will, I will happily take that guidance, uh, Mr Speaker, but of course we'll reflect on the Supreme Court uh, judgment. Uh -huh. Stuffing the House of Lords with Tory party donors. VIP lanes for Covid contracts and even dodgy donations to decorate Downing Street. This is who the Prime Minister is. It is who he has always been. As Prime Minister, he has done exactly what it says on the tin. But the real point is this, and with every day that passes and every day he stays in power, it is who the entire Conservative Party has now become. Honourable friend, for giving way, he's making a very measured and powerful speech that will strike a chord with the electorate in my area of all political persuasions who have been writing to me calling for the Prime Minister's resignation. What they are not surprised at is the repeated behaviour of the Prime Minister, the lame excuses and the pattern repeating over and over again. What is surprising is that the Honourable Members opposite are keeping him in office. Why does my Honourable friend think that is the case? Yeah, yeah. Well, I have to say, I, I, I hope that uh, members opposite listen very carefully to what my honourable friend has said. Because the power to remove the Prime Minister rests with them. It rests with them. Because they can submit their letters to the 1922 committee. They can recognise the damage that this Prime Minister is causing to the fabric of our democracy and, yes, to the integrity and the honesty and the decency of this house. It is just, um, well, you know, here we go. Once again, the Conservatives want us to sit down and shut up. Yeah. They don't wish to hear the voices of us that are here to represent our constituents. And quite frankly, are appalled at the way that the Prime Minister has laughed at the people of these Isles with his behaviour over COVID. So, if members vote down this motion, not only are they endorsing all those scandals and all that sleaze, they are handing the Prime Minister a blank cheque to do it over again. And I would be surprised if the Honourable Gentleman opposite me would accept the scandals, the sleaze, the corruption, and is prepared to give the Prime Minister a blank cheque. Because I don't want to. If he wants to do that, he can rise and he can explain. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Of course he's right to be surprised, because of course I'm appalled, and that's why I was encouraging him to sit down, because if he would just let us speak, he might advance his own cause. Some of us, <laughs> some of us actually are extremely disappointed, but I will just say while I've got the floor, he, I think, heard what I said on Tuesday. He's a brother in Christ. Does he not believe in redemption? I believe, Mr Speaker, in truth and justice, and I believe that when a Prime Minister has misled the House, that he should face the appropriate sanctions. Mr Speaker, I know you understand that I couldn't... My own argument, but the gentleman opposite talks about a contrite position. Does he not agree when the Conservative Party at prayer attacks the very foundations of the Church of England, we should be taking no lectures from them on being contrite or reconciled considers? Yeah. I have to say, we, we've had the usual 
deflection from the Prime, Prime Minister over the course of the last few days and to see the Archbishop of Canterbury being introduced Listen to them. the way that he was the established church. by the Prime Minister, the established church yeah, of their England. nation, <laughs> to be introduced in such a way, my goodness, I'm utterly, utterly shameful. One, uh, one more time. Oh. Oh. I'm standing on a more gentle and giving way, and on the issue of Christian forgiveness, I wonder if it's worth pointing out to the House that before you can have Christian forgiveness, you first must have confession yeah. and contrition. Oh. Now, Well, well, of course, how we get confession from a Prime Minister that denies everything, I just don't know. Mr Speaker, I know you understand that I couldn't let this motion pass without a special word for the spineless Scottish Tories. Because in fairness, the Scottish Tory leader is probably the only person in the Conservative Party who finds himself in a deeper hole than the Prime Minister. In fact, He's so far down that political hole that he obviously found it impossible to dig his way out and make it down to London to vote his boss out tonight. Yep. Now I know and understand that plenty of people back home are looking forward to the Scottish Tories being given a straight red in the council elections in a few weeks. For most people, for most people, I hope the people in Scotland are watching this because what we see are the Conservatives trying to shout down parliamentarians in this house. That's what's happening, Mr Speaker. For most people, it is very understandable. It is very understandable. There's Scotland's answer from the Tories. Let's shout Scotland down because that's what they're doing this afternoon. For most people... Oh, 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 oh. Can we just calm down? I do want to hear the honourable gentleman, and I know he wants to get back on track. He doesn't want to distract from the importance of the debate. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. You know, for, for most people, it's very understandable that their main reaction to the flip-flopping Scottish Tory leader on his support for the Prime Minister is disbelief and justified anger. But I have to admit, when I reflect on the position of the Scottish Tory leader, my main reaction is something that I know you appreciate far, far less. I actually feel sorry for him because he's by no means the first person to have his career ruined by the Prime Minister. That particular pile of people is a mountain high by this stage because ultimately everybody, and I mean everybody, is eventually thrown under the Boris bus. Yeah. As we saw yesterday, not even the Archbishop of Canterbury is safe. Clearly the days of the Church of England being the Conservative Party at prayer are long gone. The Prime Minister's party are obviously praying to another God these days, though no doubt even that won't guarantee their salvation. But in all seriousness, Mr Speaker, that unjustified attack on the Archbishop gives another toxic insight into the thinking and methodology of the Prime Minister. Because his modus operandi is very simple and it's this. When he finds himself under political pressure, find someone else to blame, anyone else, just as long as he never takes responsibility yeah, himself. Yeah. Because nothing and nobody else matters. The only thing that does matter is that this Prime Minister will stop at nothing to save his own skin. That is why members opposite should not save him today. Think about it. He wouldn't even lift his finger to help them. So if they have any self-respect, they need to ask themselves why should they even be contemplating walking through the lobbies for him? Mr Speaker, let me end on this point. It might surprise members that as a party that is so unapologetically seeking out of this very institution and out of this parliament, I actually do care how it acts, how it operates, and the values that it holds. And I care deeply for this reason, because today's motion isn't just about this parliament or this place. We should all know by now that democracy and decency are under assault the world over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Mr Speaker, if we fail to defend these values in every single institution we are part of, these values will decay and decline. 
It was George Orwell who famously said that political chaos is connected with the decay of language. And I know that people are deeply fearful about just how real that prophecy has felt in the last few years. Because when language decays, so does the truth and so does trust in our politics. A prime minister who can't be trusted with the truth marks the end of that very dangerous decline. So if today is about anything, it has to be about finally ending that decline. That decline didn't start with this prime minister, but it needs to end with him. Because we should all be very clear of what the consequences are if this house fails to act today. If we don't act, if we don't stop, then this parliament will be endorsing a new normal in this parliament and across our politics. A new normal where no one is held responsible, where no one is held to account, yeah. and where no one, no one ever resigns. And that is exactly why this motion matters, because it can and it will only ever become a new normal if we put up with it. It only becomes normal if those responsible aren't held to account and aren't made to answer for their actions. So I would generally ask members from across the House, but especially those members opposite, if they have any interest in maintaining some dignity and decency in public life, they should finally hold this Prime Minister to account for his actions and remove him from office. They should support this motion and they should submit their letters of no confidence and they should finally show this Prime Minister the door. Yeah.